see all these signs of the times, but that they also we've had a man that's built an ark in our generation. And I would add to that and say, and the trump is sounding. So we're, we're uh, <laughs> I don't think that's the one the Lord had in mind. But <laughs> honestly, honestly, I've been, it, this December be 40 years since I got saved. And it, it didn't matter what, what church you went to, it didn't matter what. It's his fault. <laughs> I think we're good. Right? Kill the wire, let's just use the phone. It's a working now. <laughs> it's a working. <laughs> it's a working. Is that good? All right. How's that? We on? All right. But uh, 40 years ago, you couldn't find a tract, a sermon, a pamphlet anywhere telling you how to deal with Islam. It's a non-issue. Non-issue. You couldn't find a, tr a tract, a pamphlet, a sermon anywhere speaking against uh, sodomites. If there were any, nobody knew it. I tell you, this thing's gone a long way. A long way in, in just, just a very short time. And it's all because we've gotten away from this book. Our grandparents might not have been saved, but they knew this book was the Word of God. And they knew who God was. And... and and uh, so we just, we're in a bad way. But uh, that doesn't mean that the gates of hell will prevail against God's church. He's, Jesus said they wouldn't. And so I don't know what's going to happen to America, but unless we suffer persecution and martyrdom and prison and all these things that some people seem to be talking about, it won't be anything our brothers and sisters in Christ haven't been enduring for centuries. We've gotten a pass. I mean, really, most of our lifetime, you, especially you that were born after the Second World War, from, man, from then on, we've had it pretty good. Yeah, that's right. We've really had it pretty good. And just because we're having a tough, tough time doesn't mean the Lord has to come. Right. <laughs> right. And Fox's Book of Martyrs is all about saved people. <laughs> and most of them more obedient than we are. So I, I hope I'll be faithful. You know, people say, well, I'll tell you what, if my life was ever on the line, I wouldn't deny Jesus Christ. Well, I can say that too in a restaurant, you know, eating a good meal with my family after church. But we'll see. We'll see. All right, let's go to Philippians chapter number three tonight. Philippians three, dust off an old sermon here and see if it still works. I, I suppose if we took a little survey tonight, and I had each one of you write down what you considered to be the worst sin. We might get 50 different answers. And oftentimes our understanding of the Bible and our thoughts about things are, are based upon our experience. If you have suffered something at the hands of men, that would probably be at the top of your list of sins because it affects you personally. If a family member, for example, maybe there's somebody here, and I hope not, but if there's somebody here and one of your loved ones was, uh, was uh, injured or taken out by a drunk driver, you'd probably put uh, booze and alcohol way up on your list where it ought to be. And, and so, so these kind of things that affect, uh, we're affected personally, but biblically, scripturally, all sins are not the same. Every sin is an offense to God. But there's a very short list of sins that, that cause one to be put out of the fellowship of a church. So, so we'd say those certainly to God are bigger sins than others. In the Old Testament law, there were things that cost you a financial penalty or things that might cost you a, a time out or out of the land penalty. There were some things that got you put to death. So you can't say that all sins are the same. In now, all it takes one sin to separate you from God. We understand that. But we're just talking about as God judges and God looks down upon things, there is one sin that is greater than all because it is the one sin that will forever keep you out of heaven. Now, if I said tonight murder, there are murderers who are saved. If I said tonight, perversion, there are people who are perverts who are saved. If I said tonight, lying or stealing, listen, all of these things are in someone's past and those people are now saved people, some on their way to heaven, some in heaven. 
But the sin we're going to talk about tonight is one that will cost you your soul. So it's a big one. It's really a big one. Let's look at Philippians chapter number 3. This is the testimony of a man. He's going to write half a chapter telling you about his past. And then the second half of the chapter he says, forgetting those things which are behind. Which I always thought was kind of funny. <laughs> He hadn't forgotten it too much. He just wrote about it. But in Philippians 3 and verse number 3, the Bible says, For we are the circumcision which worship God of the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now, here's what I believe tonight. I believe this Bible is the pure, perfect, inerrant Word of God. That's what I believe. I believe its words were given by and preserved by the Holy Spirit of God. So I don't believe that I just read Paul's bragging opinion of himself. I don't believe I just read the words of an egomaniac. The Holy Spirit said, if anyone who ever lived could have had reason to have confidence in his flesh, this man would have had more reason than you and than me. See what he said? The, no, this is not Paul. The Holy Spirit said, Paul write it down, if anybody could have made it on their works, you would have come in first. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, Let's read, what, uh, let's read what he said. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now, did something in there trip you up? Did God, did God give Abraham circumcision? Okay, check. Did God ordain the nation of Israel? Check. Did God establish certain things in his law? Check. But how are you going to check off persecuting the church? Does that seem like it doesn't belong there? Does that not seem like it doesn't fit? Well, we're not finished. Let's pray together. Father, help us tonight. We've sure enjoyed uh, singing your praises and hearing people sing your praises. And we've enjoyed fellowship one with another for the church service. God, it's just good. It's just good to be saved, be with people who don't cuss and swear and, 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 uh, and abuse us and hurt us and try to steal our wives and our husbands away from you. It's good to be with Christian people in church. I pray tonight, Lord, you'd help us. Show us something from your word that we can use in our witnessing, use in our personal lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take it from the top. This man said that he was uh, circumcised uh, the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Now, out of all the people on the face of this earth, God looked down after that Tower of Babel scattering of the languages and the people. God looked down, and of all the people on the earth, he picked one man, Abraham. And of that one man, he had, he had sons. He picked one son, Isaac. And of that man, he picked one son, Jacob, later called Israel, then the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of all the people on the earth, God chose one, and that was Israel. And the Apostle Paul said, well, he wasn't Paul at the time, he was Saul of Tarsus. He said, I belonged to the nation of Israel. So if he came from Israel and you didn't, he leads you one to nothing in the race to heaven. Okay? So, so far, so far he's winning. Now, then he says, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, as the history of that, of that uh, Israelite nation went on, you know what happened. Idolatry crept in, and apostasy crept in, and disobedience to God's law crept in, and the ten northern tribes split off from Jerusalem, God's city, split off from the temple where God ordained worship, split off from the king that God had anointed, and they started their own little thing and drifted farther and farther and farther from God, and finally they were swallowed up by the Chaldeans and scattered here and there. 
But the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, stayed true to God for centuries after the northern tribes went into apostasy. So, so Paul says, not only was I from Israel, I was from the right tribe within Israel. So I, I've even got a leg up on the other descendants of Abraham. I've got them beat. Among the chosen people, I was, how should we say it, one of the chosenest. <laughs> I'm from Benjamin. Then, then number three, look at this. An Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law, a Pharisee. Now you remember from reading your New Testament, the three primary groups. There were the scribes, that's the people who wrote and spoke and taught, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The scribes wrote down and copied the scriptures, but they had no use for them. The Sadducees read them and rejected all of the miraculous and all the supernatural. They didn't believe in spirit. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in life after death. They just, they were, they were secular Jews 100%. And then there were the Pharisees. You know what Jesus said about, we, we, we go to Matthew 23 and, and Jesus, you know, he rebuked the Pharisees and how he, he read them the riot act. But wait a minute, the start of that chapter, you know what he said? The Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, and whatsoever they bid you to do, do it. Remember that? Now, then he rebuked them because they didn't do what they told you you should do. But Jesus said the Pharisees were the literalists, the Pharisees were the fundamentalists, the Pharisees stayed true to the Scripture. So Paul, out of all the people on earth, he's of the one nation chosen by God. Out of that nation, he's in a tribe that stayed true to God. And out of the denominations, if you will, within that nation, he was in the one that taught the Bible and taught it right. And he's on his way to hell. Yeah. Now, he's closer to earning heaven than you, and he's closer to earning heaven than me, but he's still on his way to hell. Now keep your finger right here in Philippians. I want to show you something in Acts 26. Because he says it's touching the law a Pharisee. But he goes farther than that in Acts 26. Again, I don't believe he's lying. I believe the Holy Spirit of God is giving us these words. Because he wants us to understand something. So Acts 26 verse number 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now, now wait a minute. Let, let's try to put it in modern terms. America says it's a Christian nation. Ha, ha, ha. Right. <laughs> Among the Christians in America, you have Roman Catholics and Episcopalians and Lutherans and Methodists who just ordained a, a, a lesbian to be a bishop. Well, maybe she is the husband of one wife. I don't know. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and, you, and you have Pentecostals, and you, ha and you say, but, but we're Baptists. Okay, so maybe Baptist would be to Pharisee what liberal Presbyterian would be to Sadducee. But Paul said, I wasn't just a Baptist. I was a dress right, act right, King James, pre-trib, nothing but the blood, hymn singing, independent, more independent than that, yeah. Baptist. He's, he said, you find the straightest sect of religion in America, that's the church I went to. See, you see that? Yeah. 
I mean, brother, he is straight as an arrow right down the line, but he goes even farther. He said, from the time I was old enough to know what I was doing, I did what God's law told me to do. Now wait, I can't say that. I doubt many of you can say that. I thank God for people that went from the nursery to the toddler class to the learn how to read Sunday school class to the teen department to Bible school to the pastorate and they've been as clean as driven snow their whole life. That ain't me. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling you, that's not me. That's probably not you. You know what Paul said? Wait, wait. He said, that was me. I lived up to everything I knew God required from my youth to this present day. Look, if somebody's going to heaven by their works, he's going before I am. I don't know you, but I'm just going to guess he's going before you. But wait. He takes it farther. I could say that. Don't you witness the people and they say, well, I, don't, I don't sin. Don't you get on the street and talk to people about the Lord and say, well, I don't need Jesus, I don't do anything wrong. And you know what we always say? Let me ask your wife. <laughs> Let me ask your kids. Let me ask your co-workers. Let me ask your neighbors. Look, I could walk in here tonight and say, I don't do anything wrong. I'm the perfect husband. I'm the, I'm the greatest dad there ever was. I'm, I'm A1 pastor. But you could check up on me and, me and most likely get a different opinion. You know what Paul said? Bring anybody I went to school with in here and put them under oath and they'll tell you. Bring anybody from my neighbor in, neighborhood in here and make them swear before God to tell the truth and they will tell you I lived that law all my life. Now that's pretty good, isn't it? I don't know Christians that could say that. I don't know saved people that could say, ask anybody who knows me and they'll tell you I live this book. Saul of Tarsus said, Witnessing for Jesus to an unsaved king. Bring anybody in here that knows me and they will tell you if you could find righteousness in the law, I had it. And you know what he said? I had to count all of that as dung in order to get to heaven. Because none of that would have gotten me to heaven. Now let's go back to Philippians and let's look at that little stumbling block there. Because you say, well, surely he blew it when we get to verse number six. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. But then he follows that up by saying, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, how could you persecute the church and be without blame under God's law? Doesn't that seem odd? Come to Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter 8, I want to show you how bad it was, or how good it was, depending on if you're a Christian or if you're a Jew under the law. Acts chapter 8, in chapter 7, they have stoned Stephen, and chapter 8 verse 1 says, and Saul consenting was consenting unto his death. He's shouting, kill him, kill him, throw the rocks, knock his brains out. Touching the righteous was in the law, blameless. They don't seem to match, do they? Keep reading. And um, uh, at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house. And hauling men and women committed them to prison. That doesn't sound like a good guy, does it? That does not sound like a righteous man keeping God's law. Okay, let's back up for a second. It's a blessing to live in the good old USA. Do you know if some of those uh, Calvinist pilgrims came over here had their way? 
you would have to worship in a state church and you would have to pay taxes to support the ministers of a state church now look I don't like I, I don't like JW's running around and Mormons peddling around and false cults and false religions everywhere but you know what if that bunch in Washington DC got to announce and proclaim which was the one right religion it wouldn't be ours so I'd rather have a hundred of them that are no good and be free to prick one that's good than have it dictated to me by a king or an emperor or a president or a supreme court how I had to worship okay so so try to set aside for a minute that you're a New Testament Christian in the United States with a Bill of Rights. The nation of Israel, there is no religious liberty, there is no religious freedom. They have one God, he's the real God. They have one place of worship, it's one God ordained. They have one way to worship, it's from the Lord. But if you worship any other way, you are in trouble with the government. And the government's not, not going by rules that they, that, that they developed in Philadelphia or Virginia or a Continental Congress. God came down on a mountain and wrote them on a table of stone. Pretty serious stuff. So let's go back to Deuteronomy, back in the law. Deuteronomy chapter number 13 and find out how a man can persecute Christians and be righteous under the law all at the same time. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Old Testament, fifth book in your Bible, Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet. Ever heard of Jesus? Prophet like unto Moses, prophet out of Galilee, prophet arising from Nazareth. If there arise among you a prophet, he didn't come from Babylon, he didn't come from Egypt, he's born in Bethlehem. Grew up in Nazareth. Okay, so what do we have? We have a prophet who's arisen among the Jews or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Well, I certainly think he did that pretty much on a daily basis. Now, if somebody came to Jerusalem, or somebody came to Caesarea, or somebody came to Bethany, or working signs and wonders... It would be the inclination of a people whose national history revolved around signs and wonders. It would be their natural tendency to go after that man. Verse 2. And the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. See that? Look, if Elijah comes working miracles and he says Jehovah is the only God, enjoy those miracles. If Moses comes working miracles and he says there's no other God but one, enjoy those miracles. If Elisha performs wonders and he says there is only one God, he's the creator, he brought us out of Egypt, he gave us this land, eat it up. But if a prophet comes along and says, I am the bread of life, I am the good shepherd, I am the alpha and omega, I am the beginning and the end. You know what Deuteronomy 13 says? It's a test. Don't fall for it. Don't follow it. We've only got one God and He doesn't walk around in a body of flesh. We've only got one God and He doesn't have to eat food and He doesn't have to drink water and He doesn't have to take naps on boats and He doesn't have to sit by wells and ask for a drink. Don't believe it. Come on, stay with me. Don't, don't quit on me. 
Keep reading. Verse number four. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave to him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way, which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Now listen, listen, please, please. I'm not a heretic. I didn't come here to cause trouble. <laughs> if Jesus Christ was not God manifest in the flesh, the law that God gave Israel required that they kill him. Yep. Right. 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 You, listen, there's a reason the Pharisees flipped out when he said, never mind the Sabbath. I'm going to heal this man anyway. Well, who are you? Only God can forgive sins. That's right. And I'm going to do it. Yeah. He's claiming to be God and claiming superiority over the Sabbath. Right. Deuteronomy 13 said that's what God warned us about. You understand? See, we read, we read through the Gospels without having read the law. And I know it's dull, it's boring, but somebody gives you a Bible and says, now start in the book of John. God didn't start in the book of John. Well, here's a New Testament. I want you to read the whole thing because you'll get confused. I started in the New Testament. I got confused. <laughs> That's a big book. That's a confusing book. Most of us, when we got saved, you'd never read anything that big in your life. You cheated on all your book reports in high school. I'll tell you what, man. I don't know what those cliff notes used to cost, but they were worth every penny. But you know what? If you don't read Deuteronomy before you get to Matthew, how can these people hate a man who's going around doing good? How can these people be waging war against somebody who's giving sight to the blind and healing crippled people? Because it's a test. Because he's also saying, I'm greater than the temple, and I'm greater than the sacrifices, and I'm greater than the Sabbath day, and I'm greater than Moses, and he's got to be out of his mind. Crucify him, kill him, get rid of that man legally if you're a Jew. Unless he really is God. Now, if he really is God, you better bow before him and keep your hands off of him. Now, wait, let's keep reading. The Bible says in verse number six If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely, of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, Neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Man, that's rough. Aren't you glad you don't live in a church state? Aren't you glad you don't live in a country where there's only one religion allowed and if you change religions you go to prison or you... Go, or you or you go get put to death. Israel is, it's not a church state. It's a God-ordained nation. It is a country ruled by God. And if you try to introduce another God, it is treason. And you're to die. And if it's your son, you don't speak up for it. If it's your daughter, you don't speak up for her. If it's your husband, if it's your wife, you can't join yourself to them. Now, you know what happens? Jesus rises from the dead, and 3,000 Jews are led to Christ, won to Christ, by 120 Jews. And Paul goes into the Pharisees and he says, if you guys aren't going to kill him, give me some letters, I'll kill him. 
Now, now wait. I know that that's we can't comprehend that because that that's not how our faith, our religion, our country works. But I'm telling you, here's what Paul said. While everybody else that sat at Gamaliel's feet and learned that law knew that people who forsook Jehovah and the temple and the altar were to be killed, I am the only one zealous enough for God's word to actually do it. How about that? So when he said, as touching the law blameless, look how far he took it. Look, let me put it in these terms. Almost everybody's compromised now. Almost everybody's compromised. There's a, there's a little group in, in, in deep southern Utah and in far northern Arizona. They are Joseph Smith Brigham Young Mormons. And those men have 15, 20, 25 wives starting at 8 and 9 years old and up. You know what that is? That's Mormonism. You know what the rest of the bunch out there in Utah are? They're compromisers. They have adapted their religion to fit their culture. When a, when a Muslim kills Christians who can't quote the Quran, he's not an... Well, that's not real Islam. No, that is real Islam. The rest of them just aren't following Muhammad. You understand? That's the real thing. When people walked up to you on the street when you're preaching in public, like, I don't know, every prophet in the Old Testament did. Yeah. I don't know, like Jesus did, like all the apostles did in every city they ever went. They said, well, I just don't think that's Christian. It's not as they have watered it down. What I'm saying is whenever somebody practices the reality of their faith, the rest of the people think they're out of their minds. Because people want enough of their religion to satisfy their conscience, but they don't want to give enough of themselves to their religion to actually do what it says. You see these poor Roman Catholic people crawling on their knees and, and, and lighting candles to statues of Mary and kissing the feet of idols and everything else. And you say, well, you know, I, I'm a Catholic, but I wouldn't do that. Then you're not a Catholic. You go to a Catholic church and you'll be buried in a Catholic church, but you don't practice Catholicism because the Pope does that stuff. So Paul, he's a freak. But he's a freak because nobody else is doing what God said to do. And he said, I so trusted God that I practiced the extremities of our religion, not just the socially acceptable parts of our religion. How about that? All right, now let's come to Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter 9. Watch what happens when Saul, the righteous law keeper, is on his way to Damascus to carry out Deuteronomy 13. Acts chapter 9 verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He is so full of zeal for God, it's like breathing to him. I wish I could be a Christian like he was a Jew. I wish I could be as devoted to Jesus as he was to the law of Moses. You ever, ever people say, man, I just live it and breathe it. He really did. He lived it and breathed it. He went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Now, I, I want to read ahead, because I, I, want, I want you to get something here before we get the main thrust. He said to me, Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the prince. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now, here's why I read ahead. 
Saul is going down the road and a bright light from heaven shines on him and he is not astonished. It's not till later that he's astonished. He hears God call him by name from heaven and he's not astonished. Listen, I think that guy was so close to God and walking so close to God, it didn't surprise him at all that Jehovah from heaven would visit him like he did Saul and other great men throughout, throughout Israel's history. He's not surprised. Uh, who are you, Lord? He didn't say, oh God, forgive me. Oh God, help me. Dear God, I'm sorry. He's like, okay, what do you want me to do next? See that? That's interesting. So the light shines, the voice speaks, Saul's, he's, he's, there he's on the ground, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am. And the Lord said, I am, and so far, so good. Who else would speak to me from heaven but the Lord? And how else would the Lord identify himself but I am? Now look at Paul. Paul is having a burning bush experience and he knows it. Paul is having a wrestle with the angel experience and he knows it. Paul's about to have a fire from heaven on Mount Carmel experience and he knows it. He is in line. Come on. You don't think a guy that lived that dedicated to the law didn't sit up at night thinking, Oh God. God's going to use me to do something great. I, I'm giving it all I got. It's and here comes the Lord. And, and Saul speaks to the Lord. And, the, and he says, who are you? He says, I am. But here comes the sledgehammer. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished. Now his mind is blown. Now his heart is terrified. Everything in his world is just turned upside down because Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God, he's on the wrong side. And he's doing the wrong thing and he's persecuting the wrong people. And look what he says. Lord, let me, let me quote you a little verse Paul would write down later. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be... He didn't say, you, you can't be. He didn't say, I don't believe it. He didn't say, not a... When Jesus said, I am Jesus, instantly, instantly, Saul of Tarsus said, then you're the Lord. I've been wrong. You're right. You're the Lord. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That quickly, the devotion that he had to God and the law shifted to a devotion to God and his son Jesus Christ. And everything he had given God before he was saved, he's now going to give to God after he's saved. Praise the Lord. Now you say, Stephen, he preached and he died and they killed him and didn't do any good. You know what Jesus said to Paul or Saul of Tarsus? Having a hard time fighting that thing, aren't you? Having a hard time kicking against the pricks. Saul, for all his zeal, watched those Christians and they had something he didn't have. Amen. And he watched their confidence even in the face of death and he would lay up nights and think, I don't, I don't have that. I don't have that. And then he met Jesus. All right, one more stop. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1. You say, what's all this got to do with defining and establishing what is the greatest sin? I'll show you. First Timothy chapter number 1 verse 11. 
1 Timothy 1.11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Look what he said. He said, Jesus had his eye on me before I was saved because I was faithful. It's like God is up in heaven and he's looking down on earth. He says, if I could get that man right there. If I could get that man right there, I could send him to the ends of the earth and he'd take anything for me. He said he counted me faithful. Then he put me in the ministry. Some of you guys want to be in the ministry, but you don't want to be faithful. Why don't you be faithful and, and get God's attention that way? Don't try to get man's attention with your preaching. Get God's attention with your faithfulness. And see what he'll do. Now, let's keep reading. Verse number 13. Who was before a blasphemer. You know what blasphemy is? It's not cussing. It's not using bad words. Blasphemy is defined as a disrespect for God. Look at this. He's keeping the law and he's disrespecting God. He's zealously obeying the scriptures and he's disrespecting God. Why? Because Jesus Christ is God. He's doing everything else right, but he's not giving honor to Jesus. So he's a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Now watch. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Did he believe thou shalt not steal? Yes. Did he believe thou shalt not kill? Yes. Did he believe thou shalt not commit adultery? Yes. Did he believe keep the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy? Yes. Did he believe thou shalt not make any graven image? Yeah, he believed all that. The only thing he didn't believe was that Jesus Christ was God. He said, I was just ignorant. I didn't know. But it didn't matter. I was guilty. I was ignorant, but I was still guilty of unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now how could a man with the testimony he gave in Philippians 3 and the testimony he gave in Acts 26, how could the Holy Spirit have him write honestly he was the chief sinner? Because the chief sin is not believing that Jesus is God. That's the number one sin. So when these moronic ministers stand up and say Muslims and Jews and Mormons and liberals we're all going to the same heaven because we all believe in the same God they are leading their followers to hell because while all of those people believe in God they do not believe that God was manifest in the flesh in the person of his son Jesus Christ and that's the greatest sin you could ever commit. Because that sin will keep you out of heaven. You can be a drunkard and get saved. You can be a drug addict and get saved. You can be a harlot and get saved. You can be a liar and a thief and get saved. If you don't believe Jesus Christ is God, you can't be saved. Well, it's just your opinion. John 8. John 8. John chapter 8. See, we're, we're living in perilous times, brother. Yeah. We're living in perilous times. And they, they are not, they're not perilous because of killing. There's always been killing. They're not perilous because of war and famine and, and upheaval in the nations. There's always been that stuff going on. We're in peril because almost everybody who went to church this morning sat in front of a minister or a ministress who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is God. 
And if they don't believe Jesus Christ is God, they can't be saved. Now watch this. John chapter 8, verse number 23. He said unto them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am. See that? If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. We okay so far? Yeah. But all right, so so far so good? Yeah. Okay, don't don't quit on me now. In nineteen fifty-eight, in nineteen sixty-five. In 1974, maybe even in 1981, you could go out knocking on doors and if someone came to the door, you could show them the Romans road and get them to bow their head and say a prayer and they were most likely saved because before you got there, they knew Jesus Christ was the Son of God and the only way to heaven. You can't do that anymore. Everybody in Buffalo believes in Jesus, but he's a Jesus of their own invention. you got to back up. This is no longer a Bible belt or the shreds remaining from a Bible belt. This is a mission field filled with millions of people who don't know any more about the Jesus of the Bible than people in darkest Africa or Indonesia. They don't have a clue. You know what you got to do? You got to convince your neighbors and your co-workers that God Almighty came to this earth in a body of flesh and left that manger and walked this earth and lived without sin and died on that cross and rose again and ascended back to heaven and that He is the creator of the heavens and the earth because what you learned in Sunday school, your neighbors don't know. And the way you know they don't know it is their ministers don't know it. You couldn't believe Jesus is God and stand on a platform after a terrorist attack and hold hands with Muslims and Jews and Buddhists and Hindus and say we all worship the same God. None of them believe in Jesus Christ. And He's God. Which means the person who said that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. So, what's the greatest sin according to God? What's the chief sin according to the Bible? Not believing that Jesus is God. Now, does that make you realize how small an event the rapture is going to be? And how much work we have to do? You know, most of this world does not believe that Jesus Christ is God. And he said, if you don't believe that, you shall die in your sins. And this time around, there's not going to be lights from heaven and voices speaking from the sky. The only way those people are going to know is if you tell them and I tell them. And we've got to tell them. So my friends, they go to church. Do they go to a church that teaches them Jesus is God? My, my neighbors are religious. Does their religion teach them that Jesus is God? If it doesn't, they can dry out, clean up, put the marriage back together, pay their bills, join a church, and they'll die in their sins. If they do not put their faith and trust in God whose name is Jesus. Amen. 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 We got a lot of work to do. May the Lord help us. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for helping us uh, understand some things that are a little confusing and, and some things that seemed a little odd in your word. Uh, Lord, the, the law for Israel, it's not Christian doctrine for New Testament folks, and that's why Saul was doing what he was doing. But Lord, we're thankful for the confession that he made, that Jesus, the I Am, was his Lord.
Father, may everyone here tonight leave having made that confession from their heart, saying audibly or silently in your presence, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. Thank you for the truth of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor.